What a beautiful day to come and study God's word, isn't it? It's gorgeous. And are you enjoying the study of Nehemiah? It's, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm really enjoying it. So it's, it's nice to be here again. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm a retired RN, and I spent most of my years working as a nurse for large companies. So I was a company nurse. And so in that role, I interfaced with a lot of different groups like um, human resources and the safety department and supervision and management. And so during that time, I saw so many different leaders and some of them were really good leaders and some of them were terrible leaders. <laughs> so I really, I got interested in that, in that whole topic of leadership. So at that time I did, um, I would read a lot of books about leadership. John Maxwell was an author that was really popular at the time, a lot of books from him. Um, went to classes and seminars on leadership and I just thought it was so fascinating watching these large companies, how they operate and how, how successful the good leaders are as far as bringing about what they want to do in the company. Um, so as I was reading Nehemiah, I, it just kept popping out at me. Nehemiah is an amazing leader, isn't he? You know, throughout the whole book, we see the things that he did that display his, his leadership qualities. And then we came to chapter five and just watching what he did when there was this internal dissension. It was amazing. I mean, it just the things kept popping out at me. Um, so, so I thought I wanted to talk a little bit this morning about the examples of good leadership and taking that from Nehemiah and what we saw in this chapter. And I, I want to preface, how does that apply to all of us? Um, we Basically, we really are all leaders in one aspect or another. Each of us has a, a sphere of influence, whether it's um, in the family, with our children, it could be with grandchildren, it could be in the workplace, um, it could be here at the church in different ministries, but we are all leaders in some areas. And so I feel that, that by looking at some of these characteristics of Nehemiah, that we can take some of those to heart and really apply them in our own lives. Um, so, so I wanna do that today, and so let's commit this time and this teaching to the Lord. Dear Father, we, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to come and study your word, Lord, and we thank you for all that you give us in your word. Just really want to thank you for the example of Nehemiah and, and what we see from this book, what we're learning, Lord. And I just ask that you would um, speak through me, that your Holy Spirit would bring out the things that you want to be said and that you would open the hearts of each lady, Lord, that you would help them to take in what you want them to learn and to go away with maybe a new challenge or a new thought, Lord. Um, so we, again, commit this time to you and we thank you for who you are in your name, amen. So first of all, we have to think a little bit about the victory that had taken place in, in chapter four. Um, they had faced great opposition from Sanballat and Tobiah and those other groups. Um, but then they had success. They had done really well. But then how often is it true that on the heels of some great victory comes great challenge. Isn't that true? Sometimes you have a real high and then the next thing might be a really low. Um, so for Nehemiah, this was true. The next onslaught, what did that new challenge look like? Um, it was opposition from within. And it, it made me think of, of so many churches. We, we might see them in the news or we may, might see the names plastered all over social media, churches that have fallen apart or have had discord, and it's usually discord from within, isn't it? It's not so much from without. And I, I would say probably most of us here maybe could recount stories of churches you've been in where that happened, where there was dissension within. And I, how very sad. You know, in this case, in Nehemiah's case, Satan didn't give up. He had tried to um, tried with the threats of Sanballat and Tobiah and the others, the opposition from without, and that didn't work. So now he, he stirs up strife within. And how does Nehemiah respond? Um, he was faced with all kinds of challenges, but moving forward, I just saw there was a calm 
and a confidence and a faith in God and a boldness and courage to act. And I just want to talk about that and what the great example of that is to us. So first, I, I have like, I, think, I didn't count them, but it's probably close to 15 points on what a, a Christian leader is or a good leader. So the first one is a good Christian leader is a man of prayer. And we've already talked a little bit about Nehemiah's life of prayer in previous lessons, but, but I think it bears repeating because it's really the foundation of good leadership. What an example Nehemiah was. He was a man of God and he linked diligent prayer along with hard work. And how often did we see that before Nehemiah act, he would go to God in prayer? We've already talked some about that. In chapter one, um, when he heard about what was going on in Jerusalem, the first thing he did, he addressed the Lord God of heaven. He called him great and awesome, so he prayed. In chapter two, again, before he actually gave a response to Artaxerxes, when he saw his sad face, he prayed before he talked to him. And then in chapter four, which was last week, he prays again when he's facing his um, outer enemies, the outward enemies. And then in this chapter, we see at the very end, it's the last verse in this chapter where he prays, prays to God again. If we look at Jeremiah 29, 12, and 13, it says, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me, when you search for me with all your hearts. So definitely, Nehemiah knew to call on God. So for us, are we applying Nehemiah's example of prayer in our own lives? Do we, um, are we committing every detail of our lives to God before we call a friend? before we come up with our plan um, and before we act. God certainly, he welcomes our short, spontaneous prayers, but um, there has to be a foundation of regular, intimate conversation with God. So I hope that each of you, as well as me, that we make that a part of our everyday life is, is regular time talking with God. Next, a good leader is astute to as as to what is going on with his team. So Nehemiah was not so removed from his people that he wasn't aware of the problem going on in the ranks. So what was the problem? Verses one through six uh, give us the story of what was going on. And if you notice in those verses, uh, there were three groups of people and they were each introduced by, there were those who said. So first there were those who said, we have large families and we don't have enough food to eat. Then were those who said, we have the large mortgages to pay and we don't have enough money. And then third, there were those who said, we have so much tax to pay and have even had to sell our children as slaves. So think about the great number of Jews who um, had returned to Jerusalem. The people that had remained there before the um, groups came back they were already poor, and the land and its produce had not been maintained, so probably they weren't um, getting the produce that they normally would have had. So a little side note here, um, you know, when I read all about Nehemiah and going back to Jerusalem, you know, I got a little mixed up thinking, okay, there was Zerubbabel, and then there was Ezra. How does this all fall into place. And so basically there were three groups that went to back to Jerusalem at different times. Going back even further, um, Jerusalem, the people had been carried off by the Babylonians, taken to Babylon. And then after a number of years, 70, 80 years, then Persia, the Persians conquered the Babylonians. So once the Persians came in, the first king was King Cyrus, and he allowed the first group to go back. That first group that went back was under Zerubbabel. And when Zerubbabel went back to Jerusalem, he brought about 50,000 Jews with him. And what his main goal was is, is rebuilding the temple. So that's what he did. So that was the first group going back. The second group going back was under Ezra. And we, I think we read about that in one of our lessons. Um, when Ezra went back, he, he brought back maybe 1,500 to 2,000 people with him. And again, he came from Babylon or Shushan. Um, and when he went back, his main goal was um, reform and worship. 
the people had the temple, but they needed to be re-instructed on, on how to worship and, and what was required of them. And then, then we come to the third group going back, and that's under Nehemiah. And so that's what our book has been talking about. And so with Nehemiah, we're not sure how many people came back with him. But thinking about that, no wonder there was a food shortage all of those people that had gone back to Jerusalem and they weren't prepared for that. And of course our passage talks about a famine as well. Um, so very possible some of the Jews who had come from Babylon could have been pretty well off living under the Persians and they took advantage of the situation for their own benefit with ridiculous loans and mortgages um, as, well in, as well as making slaves of their own people. And so no, no wonder Nehemiah was angry some commentaries indicated that because of that internal dissension that perhaps maybe even the building of the wall had stopped. Now, it made me think of um, even today in some third world countries like India, some of the things, same things are going on. There's poor people, they're um, getting loans from rich people, and then they're having to pay back exorbitant prices with interest. When they're not able to do that, then they're conscripted as slaves to build, and then often the whole family is conscripted along with the children. And, and then you see all that leading into even the human trafficking that we hear about. So Proverbs 14.8 says, the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. I feel like Nehemiah understood what was going on. He was very much aware of what was going on around him. So think about your spheres of influence. Are you in tune with what is going on around you? Are you aware when someone is in need? Are you aware when someone needs a listening ear? Um, are you aware when someone needs some help and direction? Or are you even aware if someone, need, if someone needs correction? So be sure that your eyes are open to what is going on around you. Next, a good leader doesn't crumble under opposition and challenges. In verse six, Nehemiah says, and I became very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. So Nehemiah's anger was, was righteous indignation rather than a temper flare up. He didn't consider what was popular or how many were doing it or what was safe. The true leader that he was, he considered what was right. Um, a lesson to us as well, what is right? when we're making decisions. He was bold and willing to stand up in the midst of the outcry of the people. Sometimes it's so much easier not to deal with the problem, isn't it? <laughs> How many times do we spend a lot of time thinking and praying before we actually address a problem? But Nehemiah had his goal of building the wall again, and so he knew that if he was gonna achieve that goal, he needed to deal with this problem head on. So why was he angry? Um, Several reasons. First, what was going on was hampering the building of the wall, so it was hampering the goal. Um, second, what was happening was against God's law, and we talked about that as far as the usury, the interest that was being charged. And third, it's interesting, the strife was not caused by the common people, it was caused by rulers and nobles who should have known better. So no wonder Nehemiah was angry. We did look at Leviticus 25, uh, verses 35 to 39, and those were the, that was in our lesson, those were the verses that talked about the fact that these high rates of interest were wrong according to God's law. So for us, do we crumble and fall apart when we're faced with opposition and challenges? It's, it's amazing how many people are watching us as we go through the challenges of our lives. Um, I discovered that especially as I went through the loss of my husband, um, I, I realized that my adult children were watching me and, and really taking cues from how I was responding. And then even my grandchildren, I noticed, they were, they were watching me. I think they had not experienced the loss of someone they loved before, and they were kind of just watching everything. So, so how do you respond to this? And then even, I think, other people, other friends, they were watching to see how does a Christian respond to grief and loss. A couple verses here that I think are apropos. Psalm 1832, it is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. And 1 Corinthians 1557, 
Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and, and going back to the challenges and things we go through, we can express sorrow and emotion in our challenges. There's nothing wrong with that. All of that is normal. In fact, if you look at chapter one, remember Nehemiah when he was faced with what was going on in Jerusalem, um, he, he mourned and wept for many days. But it, did he sorrow as one with no hope? No. He fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And that's what we need to remember. The God of heaven is before us and promises to be with us. And so as leaders in whatever sphere of influence you find yourself, that's the example we need to remember. Next, a good leader plans before he acts. I really like this part. In verse seven it said, after serious thought. That was interesting to me. I love the fact that before Nehemiah did anything, he gave it serious thought. And the literal translation of that is, quote, my heart consulted within me. And then other versions of the Bible say, I consulted with myself. So he knew enough not to act until he had considered the matter carefully. So when you look at that phrase, my heart consulted within me, there's a couple of different ways that you could look at that. First, it, you can take it to mean that he used his heart and his mind, what he felt and what he thought. I think that's kind of an important principle for us to remember when we're making important decisions. Consider both your heart and your mind. It can't be solely emotional based on just your feelings and it can't be solely logical just based on your thoughts. I think you have to consider both when you're making um, important decisions. And then the other way to look at it is, if you look in scripture, the heart often refers to one's whole being. So if you look at it that way, when Nehemiah said his heart consulted within me, he could be saying that he reflected on the situation with his whole being. He used all his faculties to evaluate the situation. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 tells us that when we pray, the peace of God which passes all understanding will fill our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, so notice that this piece of heart and mind, it goes back to when we pray. So we've already talked about the fact that prayer is foundational to Nehemiah's leadership. So do we use our hearts and minds to come up with plans of actions or, or sometimes do we even formulate a plan at all? So next, a good leader takes action to deal with issues. So verse seven tells us that Nehemiah rebuked the nobles and rulers, he called an, an assembly, and he called them out on the usury. So if you remember, we, when we talked about usury, the definition is the illegal practice of lending money at unreasonably high rates of interest. And then if we look at that verse, it says he rebuked the nobles and rulers. So the term for rebuked here it's one that's often been used by the prophets in the Bible to speak of legal cases that are brought against guilty parties. So Nehemiah had already dealt pretty successfully with outside forces. Now he is having to deal with internal strife and dissension. Dealing with those outside enemies is pretty straightforward as to the injustice and evil of it, but now he had to deal with his own people, the Jews. So think about that in your own lives, isn't it so much harder to call out a family member or a close friend rather than someone that you is just an acquaintance and you hardly know? Um, you think about, oh, what are they going to think of me? Um, is it going to affect our relationship? Or really, is the issue that important? You know, it's, uh, again, it's so much harder to deal with someone that you're close with. And Nehemiah was dealing with his own Jewish brethren. But he was so in tune with God so that he knew how God saw what was going on and he knew that something needed to be done and, and he was bold enough to act. Courage to act comes from a conviction that God is with us and certainly Nehemiah knew that God was with him. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans. So Nehemiah was definitely someone that acted. He took action. It's been said, I read somewhere, that there, were three, that there are three kinds of people in the world. There are things who make things happen, and then there are those who watch what happens, 
And then the third group is those who say, what just happened? <laughs> thought that was, that's true, isn't it? <laughs> so I would hope for us uh, uh, that all of us have the boldness and courage to act when we need to and being assured that God is with us. Next, a good leader can communicate clearly. So in the, Nehemiah's rebuke to the the nobles and the elders, he used, sol- used solid reasoning when he addressed them as to what they were doing. And we sa- see this communication in verses 7 to 13. And I liked um, the fact, I was reading from Warren Wearsby, and he pointed out that there were six different appeals that Nehemiah used when he was talking to them. First was their appeal to love as brethren. And that was verse 7. He reminded them that they were brothers. And it, it reminded me of our memory verse in lesson three. Remember that one, anyone? Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So he reminded the, the Jewish people of their love as brothers. Second, his appeal was based on the word of God, and that's verse seven. And that's where he looked at the fact that usury was wrong according to God's law. Third, he appealed to them to remember God's theme of redemption. And Nehemiah um, in the chapter mentioned that he and others were already in the process of redeeming people who had been sold to other nations. So a simple definition of redemption is to buy back. So what some of the Jews were doing is actually selling um, each other as slaves. They were actually putting people back in bondage and it's not what God would want. Fourth, he appealed to their witness to their Gentile neighbors. Israel was supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. And if you look at Isaiah 42, 6, it says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. And then in verse 10 and 11, he appealed to his own personal practice. Nehemiah said he was lending money to the needy, but he was not charging any interest or, or taking his land. So basically his, his talk and his walk matched up. And then the last appeal he used was to remind them of the judgment of the Lord. And this is where he took out the, he shook out the fold of his garment and he said that those that don't keep the promise would be shaken out and emptied. And so I looked a little of, of what that really meant to shake out the fold of a garment. And evidently, the, they actually visually did this. They would take up the, the front of their tunic, kind of bring it up so it formed a pocket, and they could carry things there. And then the, the symbolism, if it was flung out like this, everything would, would fly out. And it was symbolic of a person being stripped or emptied of everything that they have. It was actually a curse. And I read that besides the Hebrews, the Romans actually use that visual symbol as well. So I like the fact that Nehemiah didn't just say, stop what you're doing. He gave them solid reasons as to what was wrong with what they were doing, and it showed his wisdom and how to bring about the changes that he felt needed to be done. 1 Corinthians 14.9 says, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you'll be speaking into the air. So basically, Nehemiah knew how to use his communication and his reasoning to communicate with the people. Next, a good leader walks in the fear of the Lord. And we see that in two different places in this chapter. In verse 9, Nehemiah asked the nobles, shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God? And then in verse 15, he says he didn't take advantage of the people because of the fear of God. So this was Nehemiah's motivation. He walked in the fear of the Lord. And it's what motivated him. It's what challenged him to act. And I, it means to seek to glorify God with all that you have. It's healthy respect and awe for who God is. Solomon was the wisest man that supposedly that ever lived. And he said in Proverbs 9.10 that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And then another verse, Proverbs 19.23, says the fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will never be visited with evil. A, A quote from Oswald Chambers, he said, 
the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Does that make sense? I'll read it again. The remarkable, remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. So I think a lot of those can say amen to that. <laughs> so as leaders in our homes, in areas of the church, in the workplace, or even amongst our friends, shouldn't the fear of the Lord be um, the motiv- motivating factor of our daily walk? When we see ourselves in the proper perspective with our creator God, we will have a healthy fear of God. It's the love, the awe, the respect, and the submission to his will that that relationship demands. So next, a good leader walks his or her talk. So the last half of chapter five, it recounts how Nehemiah operated as a governor according to his own convictions under God rather than on the basis of what had already been done in the past. A couple of things, he loaned money and grain personally without resorting to high interest. He didn't demand the personal taxes that previous governors had done. And also he didn't live lavishly with the benefits in money and food and land that previous governors. He could have done that, but he didn't. Part of it is the age-old standard of do what you say and not say what you do. Especially in our homes, are we setting an example of living out our beliefs? Or do we come to church on Sunday and praise and worship and then forget all about it for the rest of the week? First John 3.18 says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So hopefully our lives are constantly being refined by hearing God's word. And that's why we're here. Hopefully coming to Bible study and learning every week is changing us. We're, hopefully we're seeing changes every week as we go back after the lessons that we've discussed. God enables us in that refining process to become more like him by giving us the Holy Spirit to work within us and, and what a blessing that is. So next, a good leader requires action from his team or his followers. So Nehemiah required the nobles and the rulers to rectify the situation. He reminded them first to walk in the fear of the Lord. And then they had to restore the land, the houses, the money and the grain that they had charged. Um, And then in verse eight, he also talked about redeeming some from slavery. I noticed that Nehemiah never asked them, the people to do anything that he was not willing to do. I think that's important for us to remember. And he was also very specific as to what they needed to do. Proverbs 12, 24 says, diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. And Galatians 6, 5, for each one shall bear his own load. For us in our own spheres of influence, we we need to be specific in the what, the when, and the how of our expectations. And so this can apply to whatever roles we find ourselves in, whether in the home or the workplace. So next, a good leader is a good businessman. So in verse 12, Nehemiah called the priest and he required an oath to confirm what they had promised to do. So an oath is like a contract, which is a a legally binding agreement. Um, Nehemiah meant business. So he wanted to establish some accountability to do what they said they would do. So it reminds me a little bit about the contracts that we come, that we interface with every day. Um, It could be for a new service or a new purchase. Um, would be sometimes if you become a member of a new group, you have to sign an agreement that specifies your responsibilities. It made me think, aren't we glad that we didn't have to sign a contract to join the Bible study? <laughs> <laughs> but in the same way, we are constantly in the presence of our high priest before God, who is Jesus. So we are accountable to him. We maybe didn't sign a contract, but we are accountable. We should remember that in our daily living, in our honesty, and in our integrity. Um, and they should be, um, there should be accountability in the relationships within our families as well. Uh, but of course, expectations have to be clear to, to have accountability. So in a sense of what God 
did for us also demands responsibility from us. He offered his free gift of forgiveness of sins for a new nature and then eternal life. So we didn't sign a contract, but for that relationship, he does expect us to daily follow him and that's proof of the relationship with him. So next, a good leader is generous. Nehemiah stated that he didn't buy any land and there again, he could have amassed riches from taxes and much land because of his position, but he said he didn't. And he also talked about the 150 people who dined at his table and it seems to indicate that he provided for that out of his own pocket. When we have a realistic awareness of all that God has given us and the fact that all we have are gifts from God, then we are prompted to share those things and to give to others with a generous spirit. Hebrews 13, 16 says, do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So I've seen the generosity of leaders so often in my life, sometimes a meal that's paid for or sometimes help with daily struggles in the home or even just generosity of time. And as the Lord leads each of us daily, I would hope that we would be attuned to opportunities to be generous to those that we come in contact with. Next, a good leader works alongside his team. So verse 16 tells us that Nehemiah continued work on the wall. And this statement, it says so much. He was never one to just supervise and watch. From the beginning of the book, we see him right along with, with the other Jews, um, clearing rubble, laying brick, um, defending the wall, he was, he was right there. Mark 10, 43 and 44 says, whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. There's something special about doing projects together, working side by side with others to accomplish a goal, and it, it really creates a bond that's very unique and strong. And I, I thought of different examples of that. Um, I think of projects I worked on Together with my husband, we, we actually roofed our house together, um, we, we painted walls together, we even wallpapered together, which they say spouses should never do that. <laughs> but we actually were a good team. And I, I do think of, of mission trips also where strong bonds were created because people worked together. I, um, I remember times when um, the family, along with my children, would go to Mexico and we, we built homes for the poor there. And that was just such a bonding experience to do that together. Or I think of a time when my grandsons came with me here to church and we, we packed the bags for the military to send to them. And the, the boys were little, but it was, it was such a joy to watch them. They were so careful to get something from every table and fill up that bag as quickly as possible so they could get to the next bag. And it just... Um, again, when you do things together, it, it creates such a, a strong bond. So I think that's an important aspect of creating a team that cares for each other and that will support each other. And we all have opportunities to work together with others. So I hope that as leaders, that we're never afraid to roll up our sleeves and work alongside those that we lead. So next, a good leader has the character of humility. And humility, the definition is modesty, lacking pretense and not believing that you're superior to others. I think that we saw this trait of Nehemiah throughout the whole book and he didn't act like any other governor would have acted. He didn't take advantage of his position to lord over the people, um, to oversee them doing all the work or to benefit financially. He was governor for 12 years and he never collected or required a personal tax, which other governors had done. When you're in a position of authority, a lot of times you're tempted to want to increase either your power or your wealth. A couple verses from James I thought were good. James 4, 6 says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And then James 4, 10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So, so let it be the praise of God that you're after. I also like three truths that Charles Stanley brought out about humility, three things. He said, humility is quick to confess sin and slow to point out sin in others. Second, humility asks for and receives God's forgiveness and in turn is quick to forgive others. And third, 
Humility is content to be behind the scenes. There's something really attractive about, about humility. I realized that that, that was something that drew, my, drew me to my husband. He was a humble man. And I've realized that other people that I admire, most often, they are humble people. So there's something that stands out about humility. Um, and I think there's something very unbecoming of a proud person. So for us, let's always have the right perspective of who we are. We are sinful, wretched human beings who have been saved by a loving, merciful, and gracious God. Amen. Next, a good leader sticks to the task with his eyes on the goal. As soon as Nehemiah dealt with the internal dissension, he says that they continued work on the wall. And that was his goal all along. Think about the fact when he came from Shushan to Jerusalem, that was about 900 miles. Didn't say, I don't think, how long it took him, but I know Ezra, when he made that trip, it said it took him four months to make that trip. So we all have goals, and as I was reading about goals, I was struck by a statement that with the goals we set, we always need to ask ourselves why. What, what is the reason behind that goal? A good goal needs to have a proper reason behind it. So for Nehemiah, there were two two reasons behind rebuilding the wall. First, it was for protection. You know, the temple had already been built, so they needed that wall rebuilt to provide the protection. And second, he wanted to establish proper worship of God in that temple. So those were, the, I think, the twofold reasons um, for coming back and rebuilding that wall. Philippians 3 talks about, uh, it says, it's verse 13 and 14. I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And I press toward the goal. And in this verse, it says, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So do you have goals? What are they? And think about, are your daily actions in alignment with your goals? And then the, the last point that I have here is that a good leader serves an audience of one. And I liked um, verse 19, that was the last verse in this chapter. Nehemiah says, remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. So Nehemiah sought the favor of God rather than the praise of man. And he knew where his true authority came from, and that was from God. Seven times in the book of Nehemiah, he asks God to remember. And he basically is asking God not to fail to act in his behalf. He's asking God for his favor. So I looked up the Hebrew word for remember is zakar. It has a range of meanings. And it refers not just this mental acts of remembering, but behavior that goes along with the memory. So Nehemiah is asking God to remember him and, but be faithful in his dealings with him and to respond to him appropriately. He's also asking for God's reward. So we've looked at, I think it's 15 marks of a good leader. And going back, I think one of the foundations which we talked again already is to be women of prayer and walking in the fear of God. And again, we mentioned not just the short, spontaneous prayers when we need something, but um, daily, intimate conversation with God. Make it a habit of your time with Him. And then also walking in the fear of God, knowing that uh, your awe and respect for Him should always um, motivate you in whatever you do during the day. So I hope that you are able to take some of these, these characteristics of good leaders and apply them to your own situations. And again, you know, you might think, well, I'm, I'm not a leader, but, but truly we all are in one area or another, whether it's in our homes or with our friends, um, in the workplace or in ministry, we all are leaders. So I think that we can take all of these points and apply them to our lives. And keep in mind, especially the last one that we talked about, a good leader serves an audience of one. We don't have to please all the people around us. We need to be sure to know what God expects of us and walk in that. So may God, through his Holy Spirit, equip you to be an example to those around you. 
as good Christian leaders. So let's go ahead and, and close in prayer then. Dear Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this beautiful example of Nehemiah and the, the amazing leader that he was, Lord, that I just ask that you would, each of us, think about the things that we talked about and be able to apply them. Look at the different areas of our lives, our, our spheres of influence, and, and be able to take some of these things and maybe make some changes in our behavior, Lord, and help us always to look to you for the, the power to do so through your Holy Spirit, Lord, and I just thank you again for your word and what we learned from it. I just pray that as we go to our groups, Lord, that you would be honored by the discussion there. And there again, too, we would go away challenged and motivated to, to live more like you. We ask for all these things in your name. Amen.